Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today, Leviticus chapter 24. Uh, We're going to pick it up with verse 17. Uh, And we've just gotten the law of the blasphemer. And the judgment has been made, but the judgment has not yet been carried out, as we'll see in the next few verses. Uh, We've got a lot of ground to cover today. Let's uh, ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up with Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17, and it reads, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. Now, this law already given, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 21, verse 12, well, actually, Exodus chapter 20, uh, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not uh, commit murder. It actually reads kill, but it should have been translated, thou shalt not do premeditated murder. Now, the law had already been given of this. What this is doing here over the next several verses is expanding the commands to cover not only Israelites, but also sojourners that are, that's foreigners who have moved and are living among the Israelites. Verse 18, And he that killeth a beast shall make it good beast for beast. If you accidentally uh, kill one of your neighbor's livestock, uh, a sheep or a goat, you're responsible and you have to replace it. Uh, God preparing the people to move into the land and and have an orderly society. Uh, The golden rule, uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself, uh, or I like to say do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, applies. And that's what God's trying to make uh, very plain. Verse uh, 19, And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. And this a blemish to, is to inflict bodily injury. In other words, if someone walks up and, and punches you in the nose, uh, the return is a punch in the nose. Now, this is not talking about self-defense. If someone comes up and, and contact you know and, and 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 confronts you and gets in your face, you have a right to defend yourself. That's not what this is talking about. This is saying if someone does harm bodily injury to their neighbor, uh, the same thing is to be done unto them. But again, this is not talking about self-defense. Verse twenty. <clears throat> breach for breach or fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And does that uh, seem fair to you? Well, it certainly seems fair to me. You, you know, what, what goes around comes around is what we say in Arkansas. Verse 21, And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall put he shall be put to death. And people are responsible for their actions and they're also responsible for the actions of that which they own. Uh, Exodus chapter 21 verse 28 uh, in the following verses we learn there that if a man has an ox that gores a man or a woman and kills them but the, the owner will not be held accountable. Then the next verse, though, follows that if the owner had knowledge that that ox had gored someone else uh, in the past and did not take precautions to keep the animal where it couldn't do it again, uh, the animal, the ox, was to be put to death, as was the case in the first case, 
and the owner was to be put to death. So uh, we have, uh, we are responsible for our actions. Verse 22, ye shall have one manner of law or judgment as well for the stranger, this is a foreigner living among the people of Israel, as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God, the sacred name uh, utilized for emphasis. All uh, to be equally, all residents of Israel to be treated uh, equally under the law. Verse 23, and Moses spake to the children of Israel that they should bring forth him that had cursed out of the camp. This is the one who committed blasphemy against God. And stone him with stones. And the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, you know, that seemed harsh. Well, you know, that was God's judgment. And I'll tell you what, if we uh, would carry out uh, God's judgment for certain crimes today, we would see a lot less crime in our country. Uh, can you imagine anyone who witnessed uh, this individual being stoned to death and then they tell somebody and then they tell somebody? It wouldn't take long for word to get around. You don't want to blaspheme God. Uh, you don't want to commit murder because the penalty for murder is death as well. Chapter 25 uh, brings to a close uh, the laws, statutes, and ordinances given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Let's go with chapter 25, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Now, this chapter we're going to be talking about the uh, statutes of the sabbatical year, uh, we're going to be talking about the establishment of Jubilee and what is to be done uh, on those occasions. Verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto you, unto the Lord. And, uh, of course, Sabbath means uh, rest, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Now, the time that this is occurring would be uh, about 1490 B.C. Uh, so when did Israel come into the land? Well, we had that little matter of the people of Israel tempting God ten times as he was trying to get them into the promised land. Uh, you can read about that in Numbers chapter 14. And God sentenced that generation 40 years uh, the, all the adults would pass away in the desert. No promised land for them. Uh, maybe your children, God said, will learn to appreciate the land. Of all the adults living at this point in time that this, these events happened, uh, the law was given to Moses on Sinai. Uh, only Caleb and Joshua would be allowed to enter the promised land. Verse 3, Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. And again, when you come into the promised land after that 40 years was 1450 B.C. And you're to farm for six years. Verse 4, But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord, thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. No agriculture work to be done at all on the sabbatical year. Now, a couple things, and by the way, the first sabbatical year would have heard, occurred on 1444 B.C., six years after they arrived in the Promised Land and, and go through 1443. Uh, the sabbatical year began on the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, Tishri, on the Hebrew calendar. Now, don't be confused. There are different calendars that the Hebrews went by. Uh, one calendar began at the spring equinox. With, with Back when chapter 23, we were talking about the Passover being the 14th day from the spring equinox. Uh, that was one calendar. Uh, 
the sabbatical year I just mentioned, uh, that year began on the Day of Atonement. There was another year which began uh, a, a week later, approximately five days after the Day of Atonement, uh, with the Feast of Tabernacles, that when the priests uh, were assigned to be on duty through certain courses or weeks throughout the year, that began at the, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, not at the month of Abib, verse 5. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vineyard undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. Now, anytime you harvest land, you're going to have some seed that isn't gathered in the harvest. It falls back to the ground. That's what this means, that it grows of its own accord. But you're not to sow a crop in the sabbatical year. Now, this is just good agriculture management. Uh, successful farmers can tell you that you don't grow the same crop every year, <clears throat> excuse me, every year, year after year on the same land. You just don't do it. It's not good for the land. Uh, and it's good to not plant anything on the land occasionally. Uh, it lets the land rest. Uh, just as God rested on the seventh day, uh, the Israelites were to rest on the seventh day. The land was to rest every seventh year. <clears throat> Verse 6. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat or food for you, for thee and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with you. In other words, you don't harvest what grows of its own or the grapes that come out without being tended to, but it's okay to eat them. Uh, just don't reap or harvest, verse 7. And for thy cattle and for the beast that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be meat. Uh, the, the what grew of its own became uh, common good for man and beast. And you know, the land belongs to God. You know, you might say, well, I own a hundred acres or a hundred square uh, miles of land and, and so on and so forth. But let me ask you, in a hundred years, are you going to own that? How about 500 years? Are, are you or any of your heirs still going to be owning that land? God owns the land and he allows us to live on it and draw energy, meaning our sustenance from it. Verse 8, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years. Now we're going to be talking about the Jubilee. Unto thee, seven times seven years, that's 49 years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. So uh, after forty-nine years, that would be a seventh year, so there would be no agriculture on the sabbatical year. The next year, the fiftieth year, is Jubilee. There was also not to be any agriculture on the Jubilee year as well. Well, what kept the people from starving to death if you didn't plant anything to eat for two years? Well, hang on a minute. Verse 10. Uh, let me do 9. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet, the shofar in the Hebrew, for the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And... Uh, the jubilee in the Hebrew, yobel, and it means uh, the blast of a horn. <clears throat> the sound of a trumpet was the signal of the descent of the Lord on to Mount Sinai back in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. The first jubilee year, uh, based on the numbers we've been using with the, uh, the first sabbatical year, 1444 to 1443 B.C., would be 1401 through 1400 B.C., uh, verse 10. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land, unto all the inhabitants thereof. 
it shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. It was a tremendous year of grace. Uh, a year, you know, when Israel came out uh, or went into the promised land, they drew lots. Uh, this is written in the book of Joshua. And God assigned the land to the different tribes of Israel uh, that was to say, stay the same. And if anything got out of whack in the, over the course of the 49 years, it was set back right in the 50th year. Uh, if someone became so poor that they had to sell themselves into bondage, uh, they were to remain in bondage for seven years. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12, as well as the book of Exodus will back that up. But if someone went into bondage, let's say at the 45th year, uh, five years remaining till Jubilee, in other words, they would be at liberty to go free in five years rather than seven years. You know, the year of Jubilee, everything was set back the way God established it. Verse 11, A Jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it or of the vine undressed. On the seventh sabbatical year, uh, followed by the year of Jubilee, it would be two years that no crops were to be sowed, nothing to be reaped. Again, what kept them from starving to death? Well, we'll see here in a minute. No farming for two years, verse 12. For it is the Jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. Whatever grew up of its own was pretty much uh, common for the man or beast to eat, even the poor uh, or the needy or the sojourner. Anyone who want needed it could help themselves. Verse 13, In the year of this jubilee ye shall return every man unto his possession. And that doesn't mean that you go back to your possession. That means that if you uh, lost your land and, and sold the produce off of it. You couldn't sell uh, land. It, it was yours to be forever according to uh, the way God divvied up the land. You could, however, sell the increase, the produce of the land up until the Jubilee year. Then the land went back to the original owner. Everything set back right. Verse 14, And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of the, uh, thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. This means you're not to uh, shortchange or cheat your neighbor. And this is talking about any Israelite that owned land. You're not to, uh, for example, if you were selling the produce and you told him, well, I made uh, 10,000 bushels of wheat off of this land last year and you only made 5,000 bushels, that would be oppressing one another. That means to be fair is what it's talking about. Verse 15, According to the number of years after the jubilee thou shalt buy of thy neighbor, and according unto the number of years of the fruits he shall sell unto thee. Now, it's kind of confusing, and it's really not complicated, though. If you were, let's say it was 30 years until the Jubilee, and you sold the produce of that land for 30 years up to the Jubilee for a set price, uh, the way it worked out was that you had the right at any point in time to redeem your land. In other words, if it, you had 30 years till Jubilee when the deal, first deal was made, and then in 15 years you came upon the money to redeem the land, you could do so, but you had to pay the other person for the 15 remaining years that he could have used the land, the produce of it, up until the Jubilee. Verse 16, according to the multitude of years thou shalt increase the price thereof, 
and according to the fewness of years thou shalt diminish the price of it. For according to the number of the years of the fruits doth he sell unto thee. And so basically the land wasn't sold. Uh, the arrangement was that the land would be leased and the produce from the land would be from, for used by or sold by the person who was leasing the land. Verse 17, Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, revere him by being fair, for I am the Lord your God. Again, uh, encouraging the people of Israel to uh, love their neighbor as they love themselves. Do unto their neighbors as they would do unto themselves. Verse 19 or 18, Wherefore, or on the other hand, ye shall do my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. This means to be uh, secure, uh, it means to be free from worry, it means to be free from anxiety. Now, if you didn't treat your neighbors as you asked to be, would like to be treated yourself, uh, then you would have this feeling, or let's say you caused one of your neighbor's uh, cattle to, to die, uh, then you would have a feeling of guilt hanging on over you. So God's saying, if you'll do things my way, you'll dwell in safety. You won't have any worries, verse 19. And the land shall yield her fruit, and you shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. This is a promise from the Lord. And as most of his promises, there are conditions attached. Do things his way, and things will go well for you. Verse 20, And if you shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increases. The Lord's saying, Are there any doubting Thomases out there? Is there anyone that's saying, Every seventh year we can't plant, we're going to starve to death. Verse 21, Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. In other words, and you think God has the power to do that? You know, I know He does. He, he has the power to make uh, the, cro the crop threefold of what it normally is. This was talking about if you had the seventh sabbatical year, the 49th year, no agriculture. Then you had the 50th year, no agriculture. What this is saying is the sixth year prior to the sabbatical year and the jubilee, God would create a, a crop threefold of what it normally is. It would be sufficient to last three years. Verse 22, And you shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of the old fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, ye shall eat of the old store. In other words, in the sixth year, you're going to be able to put enough enough crops uh, in the barns to last for three years. The sabbatical year, the jubilee year, then the next year you would be able to sow but you wouldn't be able to reap until those crops came to maturity. So you're going to have plenty to last through the three years until the next harvest. 23. The land shall not be sold forever. You can't sell the land. For the land is mine, there the Lord says it, for ye are strangers and sojourners, with me. Well, that kind of would do away with the need for realtors and real estate lawyers, wouldn't it? And you know, God doesn't care for those who would sell their inheritance. What, what was God's problem with Esau? Uh, he, he traded his inheritance for a bowl of red pottage. Uh, and it's written in Malachi and the book of Romans. Uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. 24. In all the land of your possession ye shall grant a redemption for the land. Now this, there are going to be three ways that the land could be redeemed. Two of them didn't have anything to do 
with Jubilee. One of them did have to do with Jubilee. But what this is saying, well, let's go with the next verse and then we'll talk about it. Verse 25, if thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. We talked briefly uh, in verse 15 and 14 about if you sold the land for 30 years and 15 of that passed and before the Jubilee, and then you have the money to redeem it, you would have to pay the original purchaser for, of the produce for 15 years uh, for what he had already paid for up through Jubilee is what this is saying. Verse 26, And if the man have none to redeem it, no one or two poor, and himself be able to redeem it, uh, his hand found sufficient, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the surplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. And again, only could uh, charge what he paid for. Uh, the, the one who originally leased the land had to take the equal amount of what he paid for. He couldn't say, oh no, I've, I've got the land under my control now, so if you want it back, I'll sell it to you for $1,000 a year more than what I paid you for it. That was a no-no. Uh, that was oppressing one another. Verse 28, But if he, the original seller, be not able to restore it to him, or to himself better, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the Jubilee it shall go out, it shall be, be free again, is what this means. And he shall return unto his possession. The buyer uh, lost nothing by this arrangement. The seller lost nothing by this arrangement. In other words, if you make a deal, stick with the deal. But uh, God also making it to where you could not sell your inheritance in the promised land. Verse 29, And if a man sell a dwelling uh, house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year. After it is sold, within a full year may he redeem it. Now, houses within a walled city, in a city that would have walls, would have to be a large city, in other words, uh, could be sold, but if the seller changed his mind within one year after the sale, he could pay the same amount that the buyer paid him for it and redeem the house. Verse 30, And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it throughout his generations and it would be his to have and to hold from that day forward. It would be uh, his heirs after he passed away. In other words, houses could be permanently sold as long as they were in a walled city. Quite different for houses in the countryside, as we'll learn in verse 31. But the houses of the villages, these would be houses outside of walled cities, which have no wall round about them, shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed, and they shall go out in the Jubilee. Houses in rural areas were regarded uh, just as the land. They were a possession, and you couldn't permanently sell your possession in the land. Verse 32, Notwithstanding the cities of the Levites, and the houses of the cities of their possession, may the Levites redeem at any time. Now the cities of the Levites, we're talking about uh, when the, the, uh, someone was convicted of murder, they were called cities of refuge as well as cities of the Levites. Uh, there were six established, three on the east side of Jordan, three on the west side of Jordan. But the Levites were also distributed uh, among all the tribes of Israel. 
And they weren't given a possession in the land, but they certainly had to have houses, verse 33. And if a man purchase of the Levites, then the house that was sold and the city of his possession shall go out in the year of Jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. So we have an exception. Even if it is a walled city and a Levite sells his home, uh, then it goes back in the year of Jubilee. It cannot be permanently sold. Verse 34, But the field of the suburbs of their cities, still talking about the cities of the Levites, may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. Now, in the walled cities, uh, the Levites and the priests included were given a certain amount of land and it was determined by the size of the city, the distance of the wall. Whatever the wall was, you added a certain distance to each corner, and the land that was surrounding the walled city was for the Levites to keep their herds and uh, flocks. 35. And if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. And this word relieve is to strengthen him or to help him. The word brother here is ach, and it's brother in the widest sense. It means someone who lives in Israel with you, whether it's even a stranger or a sojourner. And what this is saying is that if you're able to help someone who falls on hard times, do it. Verse 36, take thou no usury of him, not to charge interest or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. And if he repaid, he was only to repay the principal owed, not any uh, increase on the interest. Verse 37, thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him the victuals for increase. Now, victuals uh, be food supplies. If you uh, gave someone who had fallen on hard time, let's say 20 bushels of wheat, when it came time for them to repay, you wouldn't collect 25 bushels of wheat. You only collect what was borrowed, 20. Verse 38, I am the Lord your God, sacred name which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. God saying, I redeemed you out of bondage in Egypt. You redeem those who fall on hard times if you're able to do so. Verse 39, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant. Now in verses 39 through 46, we're going to be talking about if an Israelite sold himself into bondage to another Israelite. Then in verses 47 through 55, the remainder of this chapter, we're going to be talking about if an Israelite fell on hard times and sold themselves into bondage to a foreigner. There were different rules applied. Verse 40, and this saying, though, you're not to treat him as a slave, but as an hired servant, as a, as a day laborer, and as a sojourner, <coughs> excuse me, he shall be with thee, and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Now, there would be an exception to that, Exodus 21, uh, verse 1, and the following verses I managed, uh, mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, also limits the years of bondage to seven years. What this is saying, though, is if he went into bondage in the 45th year before a jubilee, and then jubilee came, he would go free in five years rather than seven years. Uh, you remember, might remember uh, Jacob uh, served his uncle and was wanting to marry Rachel. Well, he ended up with the wrong chick. He got Leah. And then he ended up having to work another seven years for Laman to uh, take Rachel to wife. Verse 41, 
Then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. Now, uh, if he were married and had children while he was in bondage, the children would not go home with him. Uh, they would be considered the property of the one who he was in bondage to. There was also a means that Israelites, if they were happy with the arrangement, living with their master, that they could uh, renounce their liberty. And there's a procedure listed in Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6, uh, that they would basically take an awl and pierce the ear of the uh, bondman, and that would be a sign that he was a permanent servant to his master and had renounced his liberty, verse 42. And they are my servants which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen, not to be treated, Israelites not to be treated as slaves. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. You'll revere God by not uh, treating the bondmen with severity. Both thy bondmen, men I should say, the servants in other words, and thy bondmaids which thou shalt have shall be of the heathen or foreign natures that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. You can uh, have slaves but they're not to be Israelites. 45. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession, and passed on as heirs. One more verse, and we'll stop for today. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. Again, rigor being severity. You're, you're to treat them as day laborers, not like slaves. And we'll come back and finish this chapter uh, concerning if a Israelite sold themselves into bondage to a foreigner. We'll also get into chapter uh, 26, which is the curses and blessings of God. Got a short message, we'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back to the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, uh, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive format. Uh, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world and not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the 800 number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you know, when He sees you uh, 
studying the letter that he wrote to you, the Bible, and, and you talk to him on a regular basis. He owns everything. He owns the land. He owns the air. He owns the, your food. And he loves to share what he owns with his children that love and serve him. So I encourage you to consider your actions and talk to your Heavenly Father. Let him know that you love him. And when you have major decisions in your life, you'll, you'll find no better counsel than your Heavenly Father. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to look upon these. Uh, you know their needs, illnesses, and families. We ask that touch of healing in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we also lift up our military troops and our uh, law enforcement officers, Father, that are harm's way around the world. We ask that you watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions, see what's on the mind of folks. Uh, we have Norma from Nevada. First up today, Jesus died when he was 33 years old. He, when he returns, he is supposed to have been gone for 2,000 years. Does that mean he could possibly be returning in 2033? Uh, well, I don't know where you're coming up with he's supposed to have been gone for 2,000 years. I don't think it's written anywhere in God's Word how long it's going to be from the time he was crucified till the time he returns. In fact, he warned us, uh, no man knows the hour that I'm coming back, uh, only my heavenly Father. <clears throat> when Jesus walked the earth, Emmanuel, uh, God with us, that's the, how you translate Emmanuel, and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We assume he meant he was God in the flesh. Could he have meant he was just as the Father uh, is, that is to say, good, truth, love, etc.? No, I, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, that's logos in the Greek, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, you'll also find in, in the New Testament that by Jesus Christ were all things created. Uh, he is with the Father. You follow with another question. No, that was the second question. All right, let's go with Rebecca in Texas. And thank you for your teaching the Word of God. I enjoy the lessons. I am truly learning things I never knew were in the Bible. And you know, it's amazing what you can learn if you uh, study, you know, open your Bible and read and uh, not some quarterly uh, published by men or the traditions of men being taught, but study the traditions of God. My question is, when we accept Jesus and repent of our sins, we are forgiven and the sin is wiped out, forgotten. What then is in the book of life that we are judged for and determined if we are worthy or thrown into uh, hell to be forgotten? Well, it's the lake of fire and that's a permanent deal. It's the death of the soul. You know, judgment can be punishment, uh, which it appears more Christians, the only thing they think of when they hear the word judgment is punishment, but it's not just punishment. Uh, judgment can be rewards. Uh, many of you have a long list of righteous acts next to your name uh, in the book of life, and you're going to be rewarded for those. Um, on the other hand, if you've got uh, a lot of bad stuff written in, next to your name, you're going to pay for those. So judgment can be punishment or rewards. And of course, those who are written in the book of life, the important thing, there are more books than the book of life. You mentioned the book of life specifically. Uh, those who are in the book of life are judged into the eternity at the, the kingdom of God, if you will, after at the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. If your name is not in the book of life, you go into the lake of fire with Satan and those who choose to follow him. 
Ted in Pennsylvania, did we partake of the leaves of healing in the first world age? If so, where is this in the Bible? It's not written. Uh, I know we will partake of those leaves in the third earth and heaven age. How do I know? Because God's Word tells us that. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. If you get saved, are you filled with the Holy Spirit right then? And yes, uh, if Jesus is in you and you in Him, the Holy Spirit is in you as well. And I know there are churches that tell you you have to do this or you have to do that uh, to prove that the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Most of them uh, have someone stand up and speak a bunch of gibberish, gobbledygook that no one can understand, but they have to have an interpreter stand there next to them and tell you what they said. That's bunk, and I know that offends some people. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to let the chips fall where they may on that one, though. Acts chapter 2 is very specific. It states that there were people there from all over the world, and they spoke different languages. But when the apostles spoke that cloven tongue, uh, that is true evidence of the Holy Spirit, everyone understood even down to the county in which they were born, even the, the dialect or the accent that they spoke with. Now, that is evidence of the Holy Spirit, not someone speaking a bunch of uh, gibberish and then having someone tell you, uh, have to tell you or interpret what was said. Linda in Texas, I hear this response often when a person, let's call him Bill, uh, does something wrong, and the wrong is a legitimate, legitimate wrong such as stealing, and his friend, let's call him Jack, tells Bill that you're doing, what you're doing is wrong, Bill's reply is, judge not lest you be judged. Is telling someone that what they're doing is wrong considered judging? What is a bi biblical definition of judging? Now, let me give you some scripture, Linda. Ezekiel uh, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 through 9. Uh, tells us that if we warn people what they're doing is wrong and they continue in their ways, uh, they're going to die in their sins. Uh, but you have saved your soul. On the other hand, if you don't warn those who are doing wrong, uh, then not only are they going to probably likely die in their sins, God's going to hold you accountable because you didn't tell them what they're doing is wrong. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verses 14 and 15 tell us that uh, we're to admonish our brothers, not treat them as a is a, is a well, I forgot the word there, but you're not to treat them badly. You're supposed to treat them as a brother, but admonish them, warn them what they're doing is wrong. But it says separate yourself from them as well. Debbie from Oregon. Uh, why does, and I'll spell it J E H O V A H, Jehovah, pre represent the sacred name in the King James Version instead? of Yahweh. Well, there are many bad translations in the King James Version Bible. Uh, the word in all caps, L-O-R-D, is usually 99.9% .9 of the time Yahweh in the manuscripts. So, uh, you know, I feel fortunate, I think, Debbie, that you know the sacred name uh, you know that there are no J's in the Hebrew language, and therefore it couldn't be Jehovah, uh, but it is Yahweh. Uh, it's locked in the uh, acrostics four times in the book of Esther and once in the book of Psalms. And I don't have who this is from. I don't like to take questions. I re wish to be, remain anonymous. Uh, let's go. I am a Christian, but I st 
still living like whatever. I still do a lot of bad stuff like cursing and rebellion against my parents. <clears throat> my prayer life is weak. God has marked me with a mental problem and no children. I also struggle with lust. Do you have any advice? I watch your program every day. Thank you for being around and telling the truth just like your dad. Well, and I, and I don't have a name to even respond to. I'll, let me say this, the flesh is weak. Uh, what we do is repent and pray for strength. Uh, and then you put your spirit man in charge. Sounds like you're letting your flesh man run the show. And what you need to do is put your spirit man or woman in charge and things will go a lot better for you. Uh, don't get on a guilt trip though. You're, it sounds like you're being very, very critical of yourself. And be aware, we all fall short, but that's what repentance is for. Sarah in Pennsylvania, my son thinks the fallen angels are already here because of all the evil things that are going on. What do you think of this theory? I think Satan's spirit and the spirits of other evil spirits are here on earth. I uh, don't believe the fallen angels are here on earth yet, but they will be. How do I know? Because Revelation chapter 12 verse 6 and the following verses tell us that Michael the archangel uh, and his angels war against Satan and his angels. Those are part of those are the fallen angels. And Michael wins and boots Satan and his angels out on earth. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 too. Betty in Florida, Genesis 4:15. The Lord set a mark on Cain lest any should kill him. That mark meant Cain's progeny would continue to have a mindset to work for Satan, their forefather, right? Uh, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to receive salvation through Jesus Christ for them, question mark. Well, difficult, I'll agree, not impossible. Uh, I don't care if you are a Kenite, a descendant of Cain, that's K-E-N-I-T-E, -E, not uh, the Canaanite with a C. Uh, Kenites are descendants of Cain, but if they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they become a child of the living God. Stephanie in Washington, how do you calculate by using the solar calendar the three high Sabbath scriptures, please? Well, we just covered that in uh, Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, if you're interested, you might order a CD by Pastor Arnold Murray uh, called God's Calendar. Um, there were three major ingatherings uh, that the Israelites, the men, all went to Jerusalem, uh, Passover, uh, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, but I would call the only, I would only call Passover a high Sabbath. I don't know where you came up with all three of these would be a high Sabbath other than the fact that that were the, the, the major in gatherings would be a better way to put it than high Sabbaths. We have one high Sabbath in my opinion and that is the Passover. Bobby in Texas, my question is about the many membered mansion in God's house. I have heard people say when I get to heaven God's got a new mansion for me, a house to live in. Would you please explain this? Well, then first let's look up the word mansion as it's utilized in John chapter 14 verse 2 in your Strong's Concordance. You'll find that it's the Greek word mone, which means to continue. It also means to abide with. And you know, you don't have to wait until you die to mansion or abide with Jesus Christ. He is in you and you are in him. Uh, that's called mansioning. That's Monet. Another form of that word is Mino. 
Martha in Georgia, could you please explain Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, and you have in quote, sleep in the dust. And, and it's put for a low estate, uh, such as the serpent in the Garden of Eden was to go on his belly in the dust. And that's what that is talking about. Lucy in Missouri, do angels have wings? I think I heard Pastor Murray say they don't have wings. If not, where did the idea come from and who started the saying? No, angels do not have wings. We are, were created in their image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the angels, of course. The cherubim uh, protecting the mercy seat uh, had wings. And the, what was the, the, the responsibility of the cherubim? It was to protect the mercy seat. And the wings were symbolic of covering uh, the mercy seat in protection. And we have James in Michigan. Please explain the one world system. Does man bring it about or does Satan at the 666 events in Revelation? Uh, well, the first beast in Revelation chapter 13 is a one world political system. Man brings it about. The, it encounters a deadly wound. That's when pretty boy Floyd, Satan shows up as the Antichrist and saves the day. Uh, that's when he returns. I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying the letter God wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, and it's this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.